Every year, Reuters pulls together their list of the top 100 global innovators. Companies like 3M, Boeing, and Bayer, they tend to dominate that list with their many, many patents. But do you ever see car companies creeping their way up to the top of the list? Heck yeah, you do. Japanese automakers like Toyota, Nissan, and Honda, they keep using their big brains to make more and more automotive-related patents. And that's not a new thing. They've been doing that since the pre-oral crisis times. There are some basic creature comforts we think of when we think of a modern-day car. First, we want big screen in the dash to tell us where we're going. And it better be touchscreen or else I'm gonna just freak out. Second, we're gonna need a backup camera because with these new beefy A, B, and C pillars, we can't even see what's going on back there. Third, we want everything to be computerized, optimized, and not difficult for us to manage. Finally, the car better last a long ass time because they're expensive as heck these days. Now what if I told you all those features started life as cool new bells and whistles on Japanese production cars a long, long time ago. This is a grab bag of innovations that not only pushed car tech into the modern era, but literally laid the framework that every other single car company built upon to put you inside your company free modern car complete with all its computers and do hookers. So today we're going to look at why every car has some Japanese roots in it. Let's go. This episode is sponsored by Gran Turismo 7, now available on PlayStation 4 and PlayStation 5. I think this means we made it. Hey Jerry, you see this comment? Yo, who's the best driver at Donut? Huh, well obviously it's me. me. It's me, Nolan. It's me. Obviously, it's me, Nolan. What, you think you're better than me? Oh, I know I am. Well, why don't you prove it, Jerry? Oh, you name the time and the place, Nolan. Nolan, Nolan, Nolan. Gran Turismo 7, PS5, right now. Player one. Jeremiah Burton, 22 years old. If reckon Nolan's wrong, I don't want to be right. Player two. Nolan Sykes, not 22, and I'm about to bring the heat. It's going down, Jerry. Stop ramming me, dude. Gran Turismo has always been the real driving simulator, and GT7 is the best one yet. Buy, tune, race your way through the solo campaign, or if you love going head to head with friends, you can compete in the GT Sport mode like us. And thanks to the power of the PS5, you get the most realistic 420 cars and over 90 tracks with dynamic weather conditions and stunning 4K and HDR and 60 FPS. Whether you're playing on a sim setup like us or feeling all the subtle bumps on the road on your DualSense wireless controller, Gran Turismo 7 helps you feel your position on the road like no other racing game. No, 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 no! No! Yes! Told you, Jerry, I'm the best. Yeah, yeah. Rematch tomorrow? I'll be here. All right, I'm gonna get out of here. Later, Nolan. It's the coolest thing I've ever seen. Let's start off with how cars are made in today's world. The way we manufacture cars today is very different from how it used to be done. So back before World War II, Harold and Charles would go to the Ford plant, crank out everything they could every single day, and then Mr. Henry Ford would take those final vehicles, ship them off to dealerships. Now with that process, there'd be a lot of extra parts all over the floor and all kinds of waste going out the back door into the dumpsters. It was controlled chaos, but the assembly line worked, and it was a huge improvement over cobbling together each individual car one at a time. A fast forward to the 50s, and Tachi Ono kicked it up a notch and began his development on the Toyota production system. Now, this lean production system, while not entirely a technological achievement, was the framework that laid the path to modern, just-in-time methods of manufacturing. This meant reducing defects, optimizing build lines, and not wasting time with errors and disruptions. The Toyota production system didn't just create a new way for cars to be properly built. It revolutionized manufacturing in general, and Ford was paying close attention as Toyota unveiled their process to the world. Decades after Toyota refined and conquered the process, Ford, they were like, hey, we should, we should do that. We should use that and use it to develop the Ford Taurus. 
The Taurus was a massive breakthrough for Ford because it was the first automobile designed and manufactured using the lean manufacturing process. Oh, pretty cool. But that's just how a whole car gets put together. What about the individual pieces? Where do they come from? Well, one of the most taken for granted bits on a car these days is navigation technology. Now we've had GPS on our phones since, I don't know, I've had an iPhone. But back in the day, I used to have to print directions out on this website called MapQuest. And as you were driving, you had to flip through pages of directions. It was a in wild time back then. While Navtech started appearing in all kinds of cars in the mid 2000s, it had been test running cars going back to the early 80s. The first commercially available nav system was built through a partnership of Honda, Alpine, and Stanley Electric. And unlike today's nav, it didn't use satellites or GPS to get you around. The Electro Gyrocator was an optional $2,746 20 pound lump of technology on the dash of your 1981 Honda Accord. It used inertia to track where the car was going through a helium gas gyroscope that detected rotation and movement. A clever little servo hooked into the transmission and fed positioning speed and distance info into the gyrocator. All of this information was translated to a six inch plastic map inside the housing where a set of crosshairs would move around indicating where on a stationary map you happen to be at that moment. And it sort of worked. Now the gyrocator didn't make it to a second year of Honda production, but Honda kept trying. 10 years later, Toyota released the Soarer. Here in the US, that's the Lexus SC. I had an SC400, that car was sick. I love that thing. Anyways, it had a similar nav system that was now tapping into GPS systems to verify actual locations. And instead of a static map, the Soar's dash display showed maps that were slightly more attractive than an Atari game. And they were also more accurate. Four years later, 1995, Oldsmobile released GuideStar the first American production nav system, and it utilized all the GPS goodness the Soar had been rocking for a few years. Much like the Soar, maps were preloaded and the location was checked via satellite systems. It was a big hit, and within another decade, you wouldn't buy a car without an in-dash display that had nav. And now we don't even give a about navigation in our car because we use our phones, so. Take that. And with a big monitor sitting on the dashboard, why wouldn't you start piping in some sweet closed circuit TV? Back in the day, we used to have big bulbous windows that were easy to see out of. But nowadays, cars have rules and those rules are for safety. But safety has consequences and that means low visibility. Kind of a weird thought. We're gonna make cars be able to take crashes better but they're gonna be harder to see out of, so therefore they're gonna crash more. Car safety people, how the turns have tabled. In the late 2000s, regulators pass rules that if a car finds itself tires up, the roof needs to be able to hold the weight of the car up without crushing the occupants. It's a noble rule and it saved a bunch of lives over the years, but that rule sent the A, B, and C pillars off to the gym and get buff like your boy. Speaking of beef, if you wanna look buffer, go get you a donut t-shirt like this. See this guy's arms? See how beefy they are? That's Vin Diesel, no big deal. We're just a car YouTube channel with celebrities around. This reduced visibility caused all kinds of problems. Throw in the trendy new bolster seats, bigger headrests and smaller windows, and there's no way you're seeing out the backside of your car. Or if you do, you gotta do like one of these like, uh, like twisty things, we don't do yoga. A few concept cars throughout the ages featured backup cameras, but they were expensive and really they were just garbage. Toyota had a solution though, and it came on the same 1991 Toyota Soar that had an in-dash display for its fancy navigation system. Toyota figured if they had the monitor, why not add a rear view? This particular Soar was only available in Japan and it featured the aptly named Electro Multivision touchscreen system. Ooh, really rolls off the tongue. Touchscreens were insanely expensive back then and mostly used for non-color display interfaces like old ATM screens. But the Toyota EMV touchscreen was clever. It used a series of laser beams fired from all different sides of the monitor to track sticky little fingers and where they were poking. The grid of infrared lasers would monitor things as soon as you poked one of the images displayed on the not really touchscreen touchscreen. It would know where on the XY axis you pushed and would send that info to the computer to make your selection. Pretty freaking cool. But what about the backup camera? Well, it was 1991 and cameras at that time were really, really expensive if you wanted to do live feed stuff. And we weren't working with film, 
because that would take just way too long. Now, obviously you can't use a backup camera that has film or have the top of the line 1991 broadcast camera mounted in the back of your car. So Toyota used a very early example of a CCD camera. And CCD is a charge coupled device, which is essentially a transistor light sensor built into a circuit. The sensor sees what you're about to back into and sends those digital values to the Electro Multivision touchscreen, where they translated from digital code back into an image of a 1990 Mustang GT bumper that you're about to hit. So those are things inside the car. What about under the hood? Well, the mapping software and cameras and fuel injection and everything else wouldn't have been possible unless the Japanese hadn't already developed electronic control units and microcomputers to do the dirty thinking work that cars need to do. Today's cars contain hundreds of ECUs and they all started back in the 1970s with Ford begging Toshiba for some help. The US Clean Air Act had sent everyone into a little bit of a tizzy and suddenly everything had to be more optimized, not just to be cleaner, but to be more efficient. And how do you get efficient? Well, let a computer do the work for you. In 1974, Ford introduced the EEC-1, which integrated a Toshiba TLCS-12, a 12-bit microprocessor that had been around for a few years. The system rocked 512 bits of RAM and more than 2,000 kilobytes of ROM, which was kind of impressive at the time, but is less powerful than the processor in most common household coffee makers. By 1978, they were stuffing these ECUs into Lincolns, where they were the first commercially available processors to do addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. More than 40 years later, Ford is still rocking the EECs and has moved on to the seventh generation, which powers the 2022 Mustangs and Ford F-150s. They're a little bit more advanced these days, obviously. They use more powerful PC microcomputers to manage entire processes in the car from emissions to climate control. But without the EEC-1 developed by Toshiba, who knows where Ford would be right now. Before World War II cars, they didn't have the greatest lifespan. If you'd baby the vehicle, it would maybe eke out 40,000 to 50,000 miles. That's nothing nowadays. It took a while to rack up 50,000 miles, but the cars would crap out after a few years and be in desperate need of some replaced internals. But why is that though? That's the question, why? Are engines just way better now? Well, sort of, but the real key is oil. The earliest automobiles had major problems with cleaning oil. Most cars had a mesh sieve stuck in front of the oil pump intake to catch bits of metal that would wear out and damage motor parts. That metal mesh would keep large chunks of metal from blowing up the motor, but they let all the tiny bits of metal flow right through and bite into the smooth cylinder walls and everywhere else that metal pieces shouldn't be scratching around inside your engine. Cars would prematurely wear out from damage or clog up from the old oil no longer doing its job. But in 1920, Perlator released the first filter which revolutionized how the motors got clean. Oil would flow through the filter, but it was a bypass filter, meaning some oil got clean, but the rest ran right past the filter and kept gunking up the inside. So you had to constantly clean out the Perlator filter, but it did extend engine life. Up until 1943, almost all of those oil filters were bypass types and were only filtering about 10% of the engine's oil at any time. But in Japan, automakers, especially Toyota, had been experimenting with oil filtration systems that would filter 100% of the engine's oil through a filter. Toyota took the idea of Perlator spin on oil filter and mounted it directly on the engine block so that every drop of oil would flow directly through the filter. It was a simple idea, but it was one that took engines instantly from 50,000 mile lifespan to 200,000 mile lifespan. The new full flow system was non-restrictive and efficient. With engines filtering out 100% of the oil and keeping things clean, manufacturers could make them higher revving, build them to tighter specifications, and make them all around much, much cooler. I like cars, you like cars, we like cars. So celebrate your love of cars with the new Joy of Cars t-shirt get in an owl natural also vintage black you get it for the low low price of $29.98 only at donutmedia.com check it out it's my favorite shirt to date thank you guys so much for watching this episode of b2b I freaking love you if you like this episode please hit that like button that really helps us out hit subscribe hit the bell notifies you when we have new episodes if you're interested in learning more about toyota's reliability secrets we're gonna click right over here nolan did a wheelhouse about it it's pretty cool if you want to see more stuff at donut follow us on instagram 
uh, at Donut Media. Follow me at Jeremiah Burton. And for those of you who happen to stick around, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna pull a Marvel. I'm gonna do a bonus clip at the end of every B2B that uh, is something that only you guys will see. For those who stuck it out, thanks for watching. Bye for now. Today's cars contain hundreds of ECUs and they all started back in the 1970s with Ford begging Toshiba for some help. It got on their knees. <laughs> I got Nick to smile. I did it, guys. By the way, there's a picture of on set from us doing that commercial and Austin's laughing, Mario's laughing, Nick in the background, stone cold. I'm getting everyone to laugh, but Nick, oh no, he's a tough cookie to crack. Well, my Ford sucking off Toshiba really cracked a smile on his face. <laughs>